our last score of the minimum level entrance on the Orchestration Online Patreon is by Oscar. And I, you know, I, I think this is a really fun score. Um, there are a few things I don't agree with, or a few things where I'm going to give you a little bit of advice where you could kind of tweak it up or down a little bit. Uh, but it is really neat. I mean, it's very individual form of interpretation. Okay, the first thing, which I think is quite different, is that you are really accentuating the idea of of an e tonality here in the um, in this you know opening ostinato kind of just pounding away at these at these notes. So, like you are doing basically an e octave and a fifth, and the d is just sort of stuck in there incidentally, right? So it isn't really the sense of seconds ruling the tone of these hits. It is really an, you know, an E, you know, driving in like the whole or driving the point home about this B, uh, you know, quite a bit, quite a bit more to just really make us feel like this is kind of a series of E chords, which it really is in the, in the heavy brass, lower heavy brass. And, it, you know, with this kind of combination, the du the uh, double bassoon, I keep wanting to say because I've been reading a lot of um, of planets recently, the contra bassoon is really kind of almost unnecessary. Do you know what I mean? It, you know, if you marked it up to forte, then it would have more of a partnership with these elements. But, you know, as it is just mezzo forte right there on the bottom, it is never going to be heard all that much. All right. So the balance has to be adjusted here. And the same thing I think is true with <clears throat> with the violins, right? And and the string section, it just really needs to to hit with a lot more force, right? You you mark marcato, but then you have a mezzo forte marking, right? Those two you know, it's it's really more of a forte accent when you mark marcato, right? Now you can Mark Marcato on a piano note, you know, a piano dynamic. But it really is, you know, especially having to compete with other Marcato marked notes in the, you know, in the lower heavy brass, it's just not going to come through, right? This, you know, you're essentially playing only up an octave from the trombones with those violins. And so they are going to get swallowed inside the sound of these instruments, right? Especially with... Uh, with all of this stuff going on and the anvil all right now I think it's really cool that you're using anvil okay but the word anvil or the sound of the anvil is sort of like a it's a little bit like a ten dollar word right like if 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 you get kind of get in love with a with a not often used word and you use it in a sentence a lot or use it in sentences a lot people start to notice right <laughs> Um, sort of like the word enormity, which means just horribly evil and wicked. You know, it's like the most horrible possible thing you could do to somebody would be an enormity, right? Or if you were talking about the enormity of an act, you would be saying that that is just the most, that's the outrageousness of it. However, it has kind of gotten stuck in people's head that that means enormousness, right? So um, unfortunately, you know, certain people will fall in love with a word like that, and then they'll use it like 10 times in an interview, like I think Peter Jackson uh, with his with his interviews on the special features of the Lord of the Rings movies, which of course you know that I've watched, being a stone cold geek. Um, it's just kind of amusing to hear him say, you know, we were just, you know, when we presented the enormity of this project to, you know, the New Zealand army or, you know, or, I, you know, just so that's the problem that I have with Anvil being used too many times in a row, right? Um, you know, it it has a really cool sound. Do you know what I mean? And I, I like the way that it's being used. I just wish that there were maybe it was used half as many times. Then I think that like it would really be effective, right? Then then the people would remember that. Boom! That just like the way that it was introduced into the music, it would have just a big impact. But I feel too many times and people get too used to it and they, they kind of, you know, so watch out for those, those really, those, you know, truly unique sounds. Like another one is the, um, 
vibraflex. You know, it's this uh, it's this thing that you sort of wiggle back and forth. It's a loose uh, piece of metal that kind of goes wah, 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 and you know, once could really make a huge difference to a piece too many times, you know. <clears throat> so anyway, so I would just say watch out for that. And this balance has to come way up, right? And and possibly the positioning of these strings need to be just a little bit different in order to bring out the most, right? You know, so for instance, this E really needs, or this B right here really needs an E to complete it, right? There's these E octaves <clears throat> are real, or this this E fifth is going to get buried in the basement if there isn't something that carries through <coughs> the sound all the way through, very similar to the um, to the brass. So yeah, so so throw in the the viola there and mark everything up to fortissimo, right? And then you have a chance of hearing those strings against this. And you know what? Instead of marking them marcato, you could mark them uh, like with a down bow, right? And then you would just get a really savage, um, just, you know, very savage note there just pushing at the sound. Instead of just something that's incidental that slightly makes this brass chord slightly warmer, but otherwise nobody can really hear the strings, right? So, right, so that's my advice there. Now here you say, with winds. So in other words, to try to tell the players that they should kind of blend into what the winds are doing. You know, that is really an unnecessary thing. I've seen this kind of marking before in other scores. I would say, don't bother with that. You know, the, the players just know. Do you know what I mean? This is a little too, with all respect, I, I understand you, you want this score to be as good as possible. But in my way of thinking, this is kind of giving too much help to the player. And, and they know they understand that they're supposed to double in sync. However... <clears throat> I feel that by marking the viola's mezzo forte and marking the wind's forte, then you won't even hear a blend, right? It's just the the A clarinets are going to be um, so much more powerful on those notes, A2, that the viola will not even provide much of a cushion, right? So I think it is incumbent on you to mark this much more balanced, right? And it's kind of interesting that, that just the top line is getting wind support or getting, you know, is, is supporting the winds, to put it the other way. You know, and you've got A2 here, A3 there. Um, what about putting some cello in there, right? I, I know you want to hit this. You want to sort of save the cellos for this hit right here. And I, I can see why you didn't put violas in because you felt you wouldn't need them if you're going to do that again. But, you know, you just need to work this out a little bit more. Um, just to make sure that the strings don't disappear. Okay, but otherwise, actually, you know, I'm adding all these critiques to this, but I actually really like what the way that you're scoring this. You know, I don't have huge problems, but I would just want to tweak here and tweak there and tweak this and that, right, to make sure that you got the most out of your great ideas, right? So here you're going crescendo, but to what, right? Um... Are you going like piano crescendo back up to mezzo forte because you know, or, or are you doing forte to match the the horns or mezzo forte to have the trumpets and then why would the trumpets need to be mezzo forte, right? Maybe because you feel that that's safer bouncing off of the melody as it as it's coming in with the other instruments. Well, you know that's debatable because you've got you know you've got four horns here playing octaves and you know you don't really need to to back off so much with the trumpets in that case. Okay, and once again, you're maintaining that whole idea of E octaves and um, putting throwing in the fifth there and really giving it an E feel, right? Rather than just being D seconds. All right, now this is a heck of a lot of accompaniment to going back and forth to this melody in horns <clears throat> and bassoons, but it is a nice blend. I just wonder if there could be just a little bit more support there to the English horn. Because um, they're going to have to, like the bassoons are great. The two bassoons blending with two two horns, it's still mostly horn. But you'll get a bit of bassoon tone around the outside of it. But here it's much more likely to just blot out and swallow up the tone of the English horn um, with them both being the same dynamic. It would almost be cool to see this marked fortissimo, right? The, your wind soloist marked fortissimo and your horn solo, your horn, sorry, melody, marked 
uh, forte, and then everybody else still forte, right? Just to kind of keep it not to do dynamic adjustments too much. Okay, but you know, still a really cool idea. Now this should be marked, um, you know, since you're playing octaves, this should be uh, one and two playing octaves and three and four playing octaves. So it's basically be the identical part all the way through just done in octaves, right? So like all of this, this whole thing should look like this in both parts, right? And then you get a nice beefy sound from your your playback too, um, which can be fun if you're putting together a mock-up or something like that. This is a good way to get more sound out of a mock-up if your horns need to be louder. Anyway, um, so that's a pretty strong idea. I like that. I just think more support on the top voice. If you had two English horns, <laughs> that would be perfect. Anyhow, um, one is enough. And then you just throw in a little thing at the end. I'm not going to evaluate but that, but this is really cool. Bum, 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 bum. And you're kind of leading here with that. So, yeah, that's fun. Hard to go wrong with that, really. Um, I really, you know, I like the timpani and everything. And I, and I think that this, you know, holding down this E pedal against the, the sort of exaggerated reaction in the other instruments, I think is great. And tambourine, it's a really nice little touch right there. Um, yeah, but I mean, other than that, I don't really have a huge amount to say about this score. I, I, I mean, I feel that the approach is really strong, but just, it needs some dynamic adjustments to make things more you know, more homogeneous in the way that the players listen to each other, because yeah, the parts are already strong enough. And then maybe backing up some parts, supporting some parts. The thing you have to think about is that really the violas are not the weakest of the strings necessarily. I mean, that's not the point of them being strong or weak. It's more that they have the most capacity to blend with other instruments than any other member of the section, right? So, and they can blend so well that they're just completely swallowed up and they don't really make any difference at all to the tone. So it can be risky to drop the dynamic of the violas below that of the instrument they're doubling, you know, especially an instrument that is as penetrating as A2 clarinets, right? Because then they just, they just disappear under that, right? So, um, I mean, depending on the situation. One last little thing to comment on is the pedal tone, okay, that you throw in there. And this is great, forte piano. That is exactly what you need there. But I think you need to sort of add some diminuendo marks right at the very end so that it is a rounded diminuendo and, and it blends in so that it gets out of the way of this as it rises, okay? Anyway, um, so that was, you know, that was my impressions on this. I mean, really, just really fun ideas, and it would have been great to see, um, you know, see more of this and to evaluate going on, because I, I'm very curious to know how you would have dealt with, you know, section A and B and, and even C, right? So please, um, please consider being in the next uh, orchestration challenge that is going to be next year. I'm, I'm already orchestrating the music that I'm going to be putting in it as a lesson. I'm kind of getting that out of the way now because, you know, my, my life is just going to be crazy starting from September and there are a bunch of projects are coming, <clears throat> are coming out that I've wanted to do for over a year. I kind of announced way too early and now I've got to get after them and make sure that they stay alive. Um, just a bunch of stuff happening, but it's really great to just take this moment, take this month of August and, you know, this last week of the month and to evaluate all these things and to really connect with everybody and see where they're at with their orchestration and you know have everybody's ideas brought to bear on the same <clears throat> passage of music and to see how differently you know how individual and unique their personalities approach that assignment and it just is so rewarding for me so fun and it really is making this into a community and not just a bunch of people who hang out on Facebook together, right? I mean, what this is, which is also a kind of community, but this really, you know, bringing out the best in everybody creatively, it's just so amazing. So thanks again, everybody. And that was the Minim, this is the last of the Minim uh, evaluations. So coming up in a day or two will be 
the semi-brevs, which I just really, I can't wait for. It's going to be so much fun. See you soon.